So question A9 from the 2003 Advanced Higher. Now this might look a little bit strange. You've done complex numbers and you see this thing here and it's got W's in it for a start and it's got these things about W's and, well, with the negative indices, 1 over W's. Well, before I actually do this question, just a little mention of these things. Well, sticking with real numbers to begin with. If X is a real number, and you apply some function or some mapping to it to produce an answer, then it's usual to give the name for that particular answer some other letter, and the common one is Y. You would say Y is some function of X. Y is produced when you operate on X. And if you wanted to illustrate that graphically, it's quite easy, because X being a real number just occupies a line. And the answers similarly would occupy this line, and then the mapping of the two of them would be a particular value of x, you get a particular value of y, which would be a point in this plane. And then if there was a relationship between them, they would then form some graph. With complex numbers, and it's usual to use z to stand for a complex number, then you can still carry out operations in complex numbers. If you carried out some mapping or some function on a complex number, then it would produce an answer, which is also a complex number, and it's usual to give it a different name, and the common name used for that is W. That's where these W's actually come from. It's a bit more complicated when it comes to showing the results of those calculations in a graph, because a complex number already occupies a plane. You've got the real and the imaginary axis. So the complex number Z would appear there, for instance. Which means that to show its answer, you would require another plane. So you've got one plane for Z, you would need another plane to show the W. So you have the mapping plane. Maybe you should not call them X and Y, although you could still do that, you usually call it U and V, which means that Z, once you operate on it, produces another complex number, and that would be shown on a separate plane. The initial plane is known as the Z plane, that's the domain, and the image plane is known as the W plane. That's just to show you where this W comes from. The other part is, although this is what's actually in the question itself, I'll put it down there, just sticking with the Z plane. If you take a complex number of modulus 1, then that means that's they all lie on a unit circle. And if a complex number lies on the unit circle, that means it's of the form Z equals cos theta plus I sine theta. Now, there are transformations that you commonly make later on in Italy to try and solve trigonometrical integrals. And it comes from using this. If Z is equal to that, then Z to the negative 1, if you like using De Mavra's, would be the cosine of negative theta plus I sine of negative 1 times at negative theta. Cosine's an even function, so that's the same as cos theta. Sine's an odd function, so it'll be the negative of I sine theta. And the handy thing is, adding them together will knock out the sines and leaving you two lots of the cos. So you have these identities, Z plus, but I think I'll write it back as 1 over Z again. It's much more pleasing aesthetically. Would be two lots of cos theta. Similarly, subtracting them would knock out the cosines and you'd have one of those take away negative plus another one of those. So Z minus 1 over Z would be 2I sine theta. Now later on, with complex numbers, especially with integrals, that means you can replace cosines and sines with z's and 1 over z's. But also, at the same time, using Demovras, if z is equal to that, that also means, on a space, that z to the power m would be cos m theta plus i sine m theta. Similarly, 1 over z to the m, just putting it back this way, remember that's power negative m, would be cos negative m theta, so that's back to m theta, plus i sine negative m theta, but that'll be minus i sine m theta, which means I've got this connection as well. If you add them, the signs will disappear, 
So z to the m plus 1 over z to the m would be just, still just two lots of cos m theta. Adding them means you've got two of those. And subtracting them, z to the m minus 1 over z to the m would be 2i sine m theta. Where well, these will be handy will be in having powers of sines and cosines and turning them into cos sines and cosines of multiples of an angle. One other thing would be, where will I put that 2? Who wants the 2? Will I write that equals 2 cos, or will I write cos equals a half of that? A quick example. If I had sine theta cos theta in an integral, I know you know this. The whole point about this is, using these, you don't need to know any of the trig identities to be able to change things. You can use these transformations here. If I had that, then what you could do is either replace them with these two, a half and one over two i times that, and multiply them together. Or another thing you could do is you just leave it that way. I could say, well, I'll have, I'll have my two i, I'll keep it in just now, and my two cos theta, just keeping those bits the way they were, so that when I multiply them together, that would become z minus 1 over z, that would become z plus 1 over z. Difference of two squares, so that's z squared minus 1 over z squared. I know that one here. That's 2i sine. That's 2i sine m, which is 2 theta. Then, dividing by 2i, I've got, put the 2 to the front, I've got 2 sine theta cos theta equals sine 2 theta. Now, you knew that identity anyway, but that's just to show how complex numbers can be used to get these real results by manipulating expressions that are imaginary. Still, what was the question? So the first part, given that W equals this, cos theta plus I sine theta, which is modulus 1, show that 1 over W equals that. Now, then the second part says use de Moivre's. Well, you could prove that using de Moivre's, but I think when you see 1 over W, you're probably inclined just to write that out and say, ah, well, 1 over W would be 1 over cos theta plus I sine theta. Yes, it is a longer way than using de Moivre's, but it's probably the route you would take just thinking of the fraction. So, multiply the top and the bottom by the complex conjugate cos theta minus i sine theta. Multiply the top by it as well to maintain the value of the fraction. And you're left with cos theta minus i sine theta over, and of course that's the difference of two squares, but because of the i product being negative one, that's actually the factorization for the sum of two squares. So that will be cos squared plus sine squared, which of course comes to 1, so it equals cos theta minus i sine theta. Now that was a long way around for one mark. You could have used the Demovris and said, well, 1 over w is w to the negative 1, in which case that will equal cos of negative 1 times theta plus i sine negative 1 times theta which would then reappear this way. I'm thinking this is what you probably do when you think of 1 over a fraction because you're thinking of sorting out the denominator. Next bit. Use the Moivre's theorem to prove that w to the k plus w to the negative k equals 2 cos k theta. Well, you had that w was equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. So that to the power k would equal cos k theta plus i sine k theta. And you had that w to the negative k would be cos theta plus i sine theta to the power negative k, which will be the cosine of, maybe I should put it in just now, negative k theta plus i sine negative k theta which equals cos k theta plus i sine k theta plus cos k theta, because it's even, minus i sine k theta, because it's odd, 
they'll cancel out and leave you with 2 cos k theta. So w to the k plus, I'm going to write it as 1 over w to the k equals that. That's just one of those standard results that are used later on when you're doing what's known as complex analysis. That just means analysis using complex numbers. Now the last part. Expand w plus w to the negative 1. I've just written that as 1 over w to the power 4 by the binomial and hence show that this is the case. And of course this is where it's used to turn powers of a trig for integration purposes because you can't integrate that directly into sums of sines and cosines of multiple angles which you can do because they're just functions of a simple linear expression. Well, binomial. So I'll just mean go through the binomial one. If you don't remember the coefficients, you could throw down Pascal's triangle 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So it'll be w to the power 4, the other to the power 0, I'm not even going to mention that, plus 4 times, and then it'll be w to the 3, and then that goes up to power 1, plus 6 lots of, down to 2, and that creeps up to 2, 4 of, down to 1, that now goes up to 3, and then finally, 1 over w to the 4. Tidy that up, w to the 4, plus, and that will be 4w squared, plus, that cancels out, just leaves 6, plus 4 over w squared, plus 1 over w to the 4. Now, how does that help? Well, it's this pairing that matters. A w to the k plus a 1 over w to the k go together to make a cosine. So that pair can go together if I pair them off. w to the 4 plus 1 over w to the 4. There's another pairing here. There's four of each of those. Four times w squared plus 1 over w squared. And then there's that 6. That's what's equal to this. And then you think, well, what are these different patterns? They're all cosines. A w plus a 1 over w to some power is a cosine of a multiple angle. So that's one as well. That would be when you've just got power 1. That would be simply cos theta. So for that part, remember it makes two lots of it. So that would be 2 cos theta to the power 4 equals, that's going to be 2 cos 4 theta with the power 4s in it. That's going to be 4 times 2 cos 2 theta. And that's just a V6. Almost there. 2 to the power 4. If you don't remember your powers of 2, you just use your power of 2 calculator. 2, 4, 8, 16. 16 cos to the power 4 theta equals what? 2 cos 4 theta plus 8 cos 2 theta plus a 6. Finally divide by 16 and there you are. Cos to the 4 theta would be 2 divided by 16, that's an eighth of cos 4 theta. 8 divided by 16, that's a half of cos 2 theta. And 6 over the 16 cancels to 3 eighths. Quick illustration here of what you could have done quicker would have been to say this. Right, I was wanting to integrate cos to the 4 theta. I can't do it because it's that power. So I'll split that. I'll make that cos squared theta all squared because I know an identity for cos squared theta. I know that cos 2 theta equals 2 cos squared theta minus 1. So cos squared theta will be 1 plus that halved. That will be a half of 1 plus cos 2 theta all squared. So what's that? That'll be a quarter times the square. So it's a quarter of square the first, which is one, so that's a quarter. It's a quarter of twice the product, which would be two, so that's a half cos two theta. And it'd be a quarter of square the last, which is cos squared two theta. There's a square, so let's just do that again. A quarter plus a half cos two theta plus a quarter of cos squared, would be a half of 1 plus the cosine of double the angle, which is 4 theta this time. So I've got a quarter plus a half cos 2 theta plus, now that's an eighth of this then, an eighth of 1 plus an eighth of cos 4 theta. Last thing to do is just add these two parts together. A quarter plus an eighth, two eighths plus one eighth is three eighths. And there you are, 
3 eighths plus a half cos 2 theta plus an eighth cos 4 theta. Same as that. Possibly just that little bit faster doing it that way in this instance. But that wasn't the way to do this question though. No, this question was an example of just using the complex trig identities to transform an integral to a suitable form. Where they actually come into their own is when there is no trig identity which can be used to resolve a particular integral. Still, that's all much later on at university.